Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Nayara Rodas Musao, and she will be uh, sharing her knowledge on rhythm variations in movement and in musical accompaniment of the belly dance traditions. Uh, she is a dancer and, and also a performer, and she obtained her BA and MA in history from uh, in, in University of Rio Grande. And she recently graduated from Curio Mundos, uh, this uh, international master uh, led by different universities um, in dance knowledge, practice, and heritage. Uh, and she had research about the history of belly dance in the 19th century and about specific meanings in dance styles and contemporary Brazilian and Egyptian belly dance um, markets. So, Thank you very much, Nayara. Thank you very much, Francisco. Thank you very much, everyone that is here. Uh, thank you very much, Jorge, for uh, putting this together, Jorge and Francisco, and inviting me to participate and collaborate here. Uh, so as uh, Francisco said, my name is Nayara. I am primarily, I am a historian, did research about the history of belly dance, but uh, recently I just graduated from Corimundus, where I did research about belly dance traditions in and, and Brazil and Egypt and uh, matters of style and such. And I think I would like to start sharing my screen. Uh, can I, Jorge? Absolutely. Give me a second and I'm going to make you the host of this meeting. So I think you can now go ahead. Okay. Share my screen uh, here. Um, So yeah, everyone can see it, it's okay. Okay, so uh, my presentation is, um, uh, in the description of my presentation, I was not a very good uh, storyteller because I, I talked about my conclusion, but in today's presentation, I want to develop a bit, a bit more about uh, methodology of dance analysis for specifically for belly dance. That is something that I developed for my Korean dissertation. It's something that I'm uh, quite new in, so I'm much interested in the dialogues that we will have here, more than uh, to, to share my, my exposition. Of course, I want to share my, the, what I constructed in this uh, field, but I'm really interested in dialogues with the, with the other participants here in the, in the conference. So, First of all, I want to kind of introduce what belly dance is because I think it's not a, a common knowledge, although it's a very commercial kind of dance style nowadays. And um, I think it's quite new for uh, in lots of places. But anyway, just to contextualize it, belly dance in general is a term that refers to dance practices with origins in North Africa and the Middle East characterized by a core repertoire of torso movements, including articulated hip and shoulder movements, such as shins, circles, and figure eights of the pelvis and undulations of the abdomen. And you can describe the dance, but I think it's much easier if we watch it. Uh, I will play, but I'm not sure if the sound will play, so let me know if it's okay. You can hear the sound? It's okay, the sound? Mm. You don't hear the sound? Not really. Uh, Nai, do you want us to try again? Maybe I'm going to reclaim to be the host. And then once I give you the opportunity to be the host again, make sure that you're ticking the little box that says share you, the audio from my computer. OK. Is that OK? Yes. So I'm going to reclaim the host stages. Okay. Should I? And now okay. I just did it. And now I'm going to make you the host again. There we go. So please make sure that now that you're gonna be sharing, uh, I think I think you never stop sharing. So maybe you can go ahead and 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 click stop sharing so that you can start all over again. But okay. don't forget to click the the little button to also share your audio. Where is the button? I'm sorry. Where is the little button of the audio? I I think it should be instead of uh, share content. So the one that you click at the beginning to start, uh, it should be there. 
I'm not finding it, to be honest. So maybe uh, check the, the bar where you have the participant. I found, I found. Perfect. Technologies. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Just to talk about this video, this is a um, recording of Fifi Abdu. She's an um, Egyptian dancer. This recording is from the 80s, and she's dancing in a hotel in Cairo, Egypt. So we will put just a bit so just to contextualize what dancing I'm doing. <laughs> history of belly dance in a synthesized way because this is the main core of my researches until now but I think it's nice just to give a view a glimpse of where this uh, dance form came from and uh, the main belly dance comes from the French version Danse du Ventre that um, emerged in the colonial situation in the 19th century so when the French invaded Egypt in 19, uh, 1798 they enter in contact with a series of entertainer dancers uh, called Gawazi or Hawazi in the proper uh, pronunciation that were these dancers that used to perform on the streets for, as a, as a, for entertainment in celebrity occasions and um, Europeans enter in contact with this, with this form of dance they called it Danse du Ventre or in English belly dance and the whole history of development of this dance is embedded in the history of colonialism, uh, notions of orientalism, so the, the whole way that this dance was, um, was developed was, uh, had a, more, a lot of these imaginary idealizations of Europeans about the East, but also a circular way of uh, culture circulating in the Middle East that transformed this dance uh, through the history. And it's a matter of transnationalism because this dance started to be practiced all over the world because of the both of the imaginary that this dance had in um, Europeans' imaginations and uh, North imaginations. And um, but also regarding the diaspora, the Arab diaspora in uh, in several places like uh, North America and South America. So this dance was developed like in this circular way of like influences. The dance was being transformed in the diaspora, coming back to Middle East, and so on. So just a brief history about it. If you have any doubt regarding that, please let me know that we can discuss that better later. So what I want to talk about here is belly dance and dance analogy analysis and the methodological approach that I developed to study belly dance because now in my recent masters I had to shift from the history historical position to be an anthropologist and I had to develop a, a way of analyzing belly dance that was meaningful for me so I want to share a bit of how I did that so um, maybe it can help future researchers uh, wanting to dance analysis of this kind of dance form so here I have an image of um, Samia Gamal. Samia Gamal is, uh, was an uh, Egyptian dancer and here we have a, a really nice picture made of, uh, using the um, light painting technique that you can see the, the resistor of the, her hip movements. And I think this is maybe the, one of the first, although the, the intention of the picture was artistic, I think this is one of the first um, attempts of uh, portraying uh, dance in a fixed way and like, maybe possibly in dance analysis. So, first of all, what is dance analysis? Uh, for the ones that are not um, um, familiar with this term, uh, dance analysis is the, is the rigorous 
description of the movement followed by additional knowledge of the context in which the dance exists. So uh, you normally you do a minutely detailed examination of dance movements, um, having in mind the relevant, uh, relevance of conceptual structure. So we have a synthesis through detailed observation, interpreting and evaluating the dance. So you, you analyze the movements in details, having in mind also the context of the dance, so you can make a meaningful analysis and meaningful, meaningful conclusions about it. Uh, in this uh, matters, we have different kinds of dance notations that can be used for dance analysis. For example, lab annotation scores, that is the one that we have in the left. That is this kind of um, uh, symbols that were created by Laban to register a dance. Or you have like the, this example of the notation of Baroque dance um, around the 18th century. Uh, but for me, I find more useful for belly dance um, the descriptive table. That is a technique that uh, was taught uh, by my teacher Agil Baka, in which um, the technique is it requires that the movement sequence is filmed so that the transcriber can study the recording and take down the movement elements in order they occur. The transcriber can define the level of detail or the aspects of movement recorded in the transcription, but should keep the level of the and the aspects constantly as possible through the transcription. The level of detail of aspects chosen depends on the focus of the study and the questions asked. So this is a more um, free way of analyzing dance. Than, uh, so you have a descriptive table where you can choose the elements that you're going to put, and I'm going to show how I did mine for belly dance. So normally you do that for a video recording. You have to have we have to have a nice video recording to do that because then you can go back and watch it several times and register the dance movements. So I have the time code, the beats of the dance. So you have to mark the beats. Um, I uh, like to, to work also with the phrase of the uh, the dance and the bars, because sometimes the bars can have two beats or just one beat, it depends on the, on the music. And I chose to, to describe hips and chest movements, arms and hand movements or positions, and the feet or the, the whole posture or the movements or the positions regarding that. This is the way I choose to, to, um, to describe belly, belly dance, because one of the main characteristics of this dance is the fact that we move several parts of the body simultaneously. So in a notation form as lab notation, it would be super messy to, to notate it. And um, much more difficult for me to, to register like the simultaneously uh, movements uh, in this kind of short, um, graphics. So for me, the, this descriptive table is uh, much more interesting because it allows me like to to put in details what I want to say. And uh, I combine that with the music related gestures. That is a classification made by Ruth in Godoy. So uh, this author, he classifies music related gestures that will be uh, gestures that are made at related to music, and he classifies two kinds of the music um, producing gestures that are, for example, producing a sound with a movement, or when you're beating something, when you're producing sounds with your movement, or are the um, sound accompanying gestures. Um, so in this sense, uh, he classifies the sound accompanying gestures in three categories. So we have iterative, meaning rapid repetition or small movements. Uh, impulsive, meaning discontinuous spike of effort, followed by re relaxation, or sustained, meaning continuous effort. And for me, this is uh, very useful for belly dance because uh, in belly dance, we have these kinds of movements. So here, I would like not just to describe it, but to perform it because I think it's better for this visualization. So I will show for you. Is it possible to see me? Okay, so um, in the iterative kind of, of gestures, we have like the small repetitions. So in many dance, it is easily associated with shimmies from hips or the shoulders. So shimmies would be like this from the hips or this from the shoulders. 
Or we have uh, fast and continuous beats, like this. It is continuous and fast. Or we have the fast torsions or twists, that would be this. And you can do that with the, our hands also, like fast movements of hands, like this. If you want to try, uh, I think uh, doing dance analysis, it's really important to embody these movements because it makes everything much easier. So if you, like you are here watching, if you want to try to do with your hand the same kind of movements, feel free. Uh, so this interactive movement is like that. You can do with the hand like this, or with the head, or with the hips. Okay? Second kind of F, um, movement are the impulsive gestures. That in this case, we can do hips, chest, head, and limb accents. Accents would be like these um, markings on the beats of the music. For example, I can do a beat, I can do an accent with my chest, I can do another beat, a bit up, a bit down, and this kind of um, gestures I can also do with my hand, like fast like that, fast like that, or in my head. Is this kind of gestures that are uh, precise in the beats and uh, fast and also followed by a relax relaxation. So the last kind of um, movement that Godai classifies is the kind of sustained movements. So they can be slow and serious movements, uh, such as pelvis, hips, and arm undulations, circles, eight, and figures. So uh, in belly dance, we have the undulations with the arms. We have undulations with the hips. We can do this pelvis undulation. We can do figure eight. This kind of sustained movements that are continuous and slow. Normally they are slow. Okay, uh, I will demonstrate now in the music the, the combination of these different movements so we can, uh, if you want also follow the music uh, back there in your home. So. Um, Here I have an instrumental music. Uh, normally we associate these, these movements with instruments. So in this music we have a violin that normally asks for sustained movements. And we also have a canoe that is a kind of uh, instrument uh, of string and normally asks for intuitive movements. And normally the, um, the percussion asks for iterative movements. But it depends a lot on the musical reading of the dancer, and that uh, that's one of the main features of belly dance. Like, it all depends on the musical reader reading of the dancer. So uh, I'm going to show you an example of this song. I'm the only one who understood uh, what I'm talking about. I hope it wasn't that. And so, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so, these are the music related gestures that I, I, I like to use in my dance analysis. And I'm going to show an example of how I did it, that in my dissertation. So I have the table, and the last um, column I use the I classify them in the sound related gestures. I put the colors, and uh, in the end I made a like a small graphic showing the um, amount of movements used in the um, in the performance that were impulsive, interactive, or sustained. And that was relevant in my in my dissertation to analyze the differences of dance styles in Brazil and Egypt through this table. So for me, that's really meaningful. So um, if you have any question uh, regarding that, uh, I'll be happy to answer in the end. So 
What about, so we're talking about uh, music accompanying gestures. So like the dancer is accompanying the music. But what about when dance and music are being produced together? So uh, here I will do the study case of uh, Pablo Solo, that uh, when music and dance were being produced together in an improv improvisational form. So just contextualizing the, the video I will be analyzing, this is a video of a dancer called Pislo Funtura, that by chance is my <laughs> dance teacher. So this was the first, um, my first uh, exercise of doing dance analysis. So I chose to, uh, to do a dance analysis of my teacher because I know well her movements and I knew that it would be easier for me to know what she was doing with her body and I could imitate myself, so it would be easier to put that on a, on a table. So I chose to do a uh, video from her because of that and because it was my first exercise in the sense, which was pretty interesting. The musician in the video is a musician called Ibrahim Barahel, and he's playing an Egyptian tabla. Uh, my, my correct saying always correct for table is always tabla. Uh, it's this instrument that here, is here in the right, uh, it's, a, it's a drum. And the place where the performance is happening is Amawa restaurant in uh, Roche uh, Hotana Hotel in Dubai in United Arab Emirates. It was a uh, perform uh, performance from 2017. So I first I want to show you this performance, and then you know, like I would like to tell some conclusions I have from analyzing this dance, and I would be very glad to to know your perspectives on the same performance. Okay, so um, what is important, important to notice in this performance is that both the dancer and the musicians are improvising together. So they are, uh, of course, it was well rehearsed before, like they know each other well, so it's like, um, you can imagine it's like a jazz jam. Like they are improvising together, uh, they, have, they know their structure, but the thing is coming out by the time. And for me, what is really interesting about this, this uh, performance is that there is a really interesting dialogue between the two parts of the, the, the musician in the dancing in general. So I will play here for us. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Sue just showed me that the video is not well being, is not uh, appearing well for everyone. I hope um, it was enough to see some of the features that I want to discuss about it. Um, let I see it here. So how we did the dance analysis of this video? I did the same table I showed you before. But in the, this case, I also um, did the um, uh, um, column for the music uh, and the drum, like to talk, to describe the relationship between the music being produced and the, the movements being produced at the same time. So uh, in this case, she also uses um, very complex uh, movements because she mixes the, the iterative, uh, the sustained, and uh, the um, impulsive gestures in one gesture. So she she does a lot. Uh, she does shimmies, but doing undulations. So she's mixing the the both kind of movements, uh, making it more complex. So she can read more layers of this music, or she also can produce more layers in this music. So uh, what does analysis say? Uh, I think it's very interesting from this video is the communication that is happening there. So you have um, communication via eye contact. So you see that she looks at the, the, the musician and the musician is all the time looking at her. So they have direct gestures. She, she tells him like stop, stop or no, go on with her hands like in a very uh, direct way. But she also signs that through dance movements. So you can see that he just starts playing when she starts moving her hips. Not uh, exactly. She can say, okay, let's go. But then she starts to perform the shimmy. The the and then he starts to play the drum. I think it is very interesting, this dialogue that they, the, both the musician and the, the dancer are developing. Because the start of the music, the end of the music and the dance, and the speed are, and the accents are all agreed between both of them simultaneously by the time they are performing. So um, maybe I can come back, maybe we'll show, I hope it, uh, the video is Yes, do you want to show another video? No, it's the same. Ah, uh, because it, I think uh, somebody uh, helped me with a, a good option that maybe we can benefit from. So in the same section that says share content, there should be an option to share video so that the, um, the band of the mm -hmm. internet, it's, it's better and it's not fragmented for the, the participants. So let's, let's try that one. Um, okay, Thank you optimized for sharing for video clip. Maybe a try. Uh -huh. Let me see. So that we can see it better. Mm, no. I want to go back here. Well, apparently it's not working. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I hope that in the video uh, it was kind of uh, possible to see that when she was performing the accents, he was also performing the accents, and sometimes you can notice that he's following her, and other times she's following him. So uh, when she make, makes accents with her chest, for example, he makes uh, the beats are stronger. Or when she uh, she's doing the shimmy and he's in the rush doing the drumming, but when she starts undulations while she do, does the shimmy, he also uh, puts different accents in different volumes in uh, his um, in the beats. So I think it's very interesting to analyze this dialogue. And I also think it's interesting to notice that the whole piece is improvised, but it's not random. Because as uh, Anka Bergesco poses, uh, improvisation is based in patterns, reference, previous experiences, and it mostly rely on some redundant and familiar aspects to be recognizable by the other members of the community. So it will not, never work for someone that doesn't have any training in belly dance and you have to have a lot of training to ar arrive in a point that you can improvise that way with a musician. And of course the musician has to have like this training 
and they have to both be in, in synchrony. They have to have rehearsed a lot. They have to know each other a lot. So it's not a it's not a random thing. It's not a thing that will happen by chance. But uh, it's a very interesting kind of way of communication of through music and dance that I think it's worth mm -hmm. to analyze through this video. So um, coming to my conclusions. Uh, so what? What does information can tell us about dance? And um, I think I like to talk. I would like to talk about a bit about hierarchies, because, uh, for example, Godoy in his um, text I took the, the classifications from, he suggests just two kinds of gestural affordances, um, movements. So it's the sound producing gestures that I already told you is like something that produces sounds, and the other one is the sound accompanying gestures. That is normally is how dance is classified. But in this, um, in this specific video, in this specific situation, we can talk about a third kind of uh, a movement that is the sound inducing gestures. Because the gestures of the dancer are inducing the sounds that are being produ produced uh, by the, the musician. And I think that dialogues a lot with what uh, Sue was uh, developing yesterday about the rhythms of uh, the ballet rhythms and uh, the daily routines that um, you you can uh, have these both um, dialogues and these both ways of interacting with music, like the the music interacting with the bodies and the body interacting with the music. And um, so I would like to, to, to suggest that in this case, you have the, the sound in, in the same gestures. And in this case, you have a horizontality in the, this normally post hierarchy between dance and music. And I also would like to bring a reflection for the discussion that, uh, for example, for contemporary dance is very well discussed how uh, this, this breaks within a hierarchy with music. So, Mother dance tried to break this hierarchy by dancing not to the music, putting just music by uh, like uh, environment music or dan dance with no music at all because uh, they were trying to break with this hierarchy, but posing another hierarchy saying, no, dance is more important than music. And I think that uh, this um, tendency of putting hierarchies and everything is a very Western tendency. And I would like to suggest that in this case, you have you indeed have a break of hierarchy because you have it being produced the music and dance being produced in a horizontal way, in a dialogue between musician and dancer. So uh, regarding that, I would like to share another video that um, I don't know if you would be nice played. I hope so. But uh, these dances I, I bring again Fifty Abdu, and this is a performance also in a hotel in Cairo in the eighties, and where she have a really big. Uh, live band, which is awesome. And uh, I think it's very interesting the way she plays with the band. So let's see if it's... <laughs> and I hope you have noticed how she plays with the silence so she does the whole shimmy that she's really famous uh, for her shimmy that is an incredible um, signature of her dance her incredible shimmy like very loose and very rhythmic and she plays with the music with the accents of the music and the band plays according to her cues and I think that's a really interesting uh, way of um, thinking about this relationship between dancer and musicians. And, um, 
That's it. Uh, I bring here my bibliography, and now I open the um, the room for the debate for questions. And I would like to uh, to know what other people have to say about it. And thank you very much for staying with me. Thank you very much, Nayara. That's a wonderful presentation as well. Very interesting topic. So I'm going to make you a, a question and then uh, for the rest of the participants, everyone, please feel free to ask uh, either directly or by chat. Um, so I was wondering uh, on, on, um, regarding the, the, this table that you bring, uh, which can be, of course, a, a easy solution uh, instead of lab annotation or, or other dance annotation systems. Um, wondering if, if how that, what do you think about it? If how that work with more than one dancer? That's one one thing. Um, and then, if we could also add, uh, is there any space to add information, for instance, about the audience, about the environment of uh, of the dance, and and like the bigger scenario where dance is happening. Thank you so much, Nayara. Thank you very much for the question, Francisco. And I think yeah, the advantage of the table is exactly that you can add as much as information as you want. Uh, the thing is, like, also sometimes the much as information as you want, the more lost you are. <laughs> but uh, I think it's very important to to have a clear research question when you're producing the table. So I think, it, for example, the, the, to adding a table for the audience, for example, would be amazing if your research question is exactly about the, this interaction between the dancer and the audience. And in the video I show you, you could see clearly that uh, this interaction was really important because she was uh, calling the audience to clap, calling the audience like to cheer her, her up. She's, um, she's drinking a lot from her, the energy of the audience to produce her dance. So uh, I think it would be really interesting, for example, to analyze this relationship. So we would have like a table, like a column for the, the audience, or I think to add more than one dancer would be really difficult, but I think it's also possible. And as if this was my first um, exercise of doing dance analysis, I, I, I chose like something that I, for me was easy. It was just one dancer that is my te teacher that I know very well her movements. I know the way she dances. So uh, for me, it was much easier this way. But I think in like when you're doing research, like you pose your own limits and you pose your own research questions. And I think the, you have to, to make the things adapt to you, not you adapt to the, the, the theories. I think the, the, the theories have, or the methodology have to help you to, to, to get somewhere, not you have like to put everything in the boxes. So like, you can adequate your, your research for in these boxes. Thank you so much for your question, Nayara. Mm, looking if uh, someone have raised uh, the hands and also looking at the chat box. I, I can't see the chat box, Jorge. Can you? Uh, yes, let me check right now. I don't think for the moment we don't have written questions, but feel free, anyone else who is in this session. I think we just got the, the hand from Juan, so please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Well, thank you for a great presentation, and it was really cool to see you dance. I hadn't seen you dance before, <laughs> like barely dance. Um, and um, this is a very simple one, but it's just uh, what motivated you to carry out uh, structural analysis in your dance? Uh, what is the value in it? How, uh, yeah, what, you know, what are the motivations? What's the, the contribution that you see behind that? <clears throat> Yes, well, in this first exercise, to be honest, I had to do it for the dance analysis course we had, so I didn't have much choice. But, uh, <laughs> but I think in the first moment, I was really um, valuing that very much. I was like, movements don't say anything for me, I'm more interested in the history, I'm more interested in the politics of, of dancing. I don't know, I don't see where movement can, can teach me anything or can say anything to me. 
But after uh, a while, I got convinced that yes, it can be really helpful. And for example, in my dissertation, I, anal I analyzed um, the two videos of the same dancer, a Brazilian dancer that uh, she went to work in Egypt. So I have one video of her, of her before going to work in Egypt, she's dancing in Sao Paulo, and another one after she went to work in Egypt. And it was clear the difference between styles and the, the description of the movements and the classification and the um, sound related gestures were really useful to me to understand which kind of movements she was performing, what was the difference of the styles, how she had to, to, to change her dance style to a new environment of working. Because uh, belly dance, this is a, the issue about belly dance, it's a commercial dance. So you to adequate it to uh, all um, demands. And she had to do that when she went to Egypt. And she told me that in her interview that I have with her, and she told me how she had to adapt her dance. And I could see that clearly in the, in the videos. And it was much more clear when I, I noted it and I classified it. So for me, it was helpful in this sense. I think all this, um, dance analysis thing, I, I think it depends a lot on your research question, what you're looking at. Because mm -hmm. something, at something that movement doesn't matter, like you're not going to find anything. But mm -hmm. uh, if you like, if you take a look like uh, this deep look into a dance, I think it can say, say a lot for you. Thank you. Uh, Thank now you. I, I, Sorry to interrupt you, Fran Francisco. It's, um, it's just that I found a question on the chat box, so I wanted to read it out loud for Nayara. So it's it's a question from Michel Federnadov, and it says, "Could you discuss how this concept of the gestural affordances apply also to the musicians and their instruments? For instance, communication between musician and artifact." Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually in, in Godoy's uh, classification, when he classifies the movement between iterative, impulsive, and sustained, he's talking about the movement accompanying gestures. There are not the ones that are exactly producing music. Because uh, when you're talking about the musician, uh, the gestures that he's uh, performing are here in the, in the drum. So I think mostly they will be, like if we classify them the same classification, they will be interactive or impulsive. You will not have like the, the sustain as we do when you're playing a violin, for example. So uh, I think this classification uh, is more useful when you're talking about dance. And for the movements, for the musician, I think it will be another classification, maybe. I don't know if this answers the, the question, but uh, what I wanted to do with this classification is to, to help us to understand how these two things, like music and dance, can dialogue. Because you're talking about the sustained movement, it's because the sound is also sustained, not exactly the movement of the musician that is producing the sound. So you have a sustained uh, sound, like the musician can be playing the drum and you can be doing that. There are different, um, um, different qualities of movement. And I don't know if that answers the question. But thank you for it. <laughs> thank you for the question. Thank you very much, uh, Nayara, for your question. Uh, does anyone have uh, more questions? Yes, uh, can I go ahead with uh, my very own question, Francisco? Um, I wanted to ask uh, Nayara if you, if you consider this combination or this influence between the, the hierarchies that you expose over your presentation and the context of the dancer or the participants of the dance event, because I was wondering if... Um, according to the status or the perceived status of the dancer, she or he might, might feel entitled to do, to control more the, the coordination with the music and to, to, to own this, this possibility to stop him from, from playing or to, to direct him to keep going on according to her desire. So 
I don't know if this is something that you came across with or do you think it's relevant to, to broaden this conversation? Yes, um, this is a tricky, um, tricky situation because yeah, it has a lot to do with status because the fact that you have a live band playing and with you, it means that you're already a recognized dancer and a well-established dancer because of course bands are expensive. So normally, at least I can say about Egypt, like I think Egypt and the Emirates have like different situations also like in, the, in Brazil, that is the, where um, I have more knowledge about. So for example, in Egypt, um, the dancers, they have their own band, but they have to manage the band and they have to pay the musicians. So um, it, it shows a lot of the status of the dancer and how, how much she, uh, she's earning for the dance shows, of course. But for example, in the case of uh, Dubai where uh, Priscilla was dancing is different because the, the venues, the establishments that have their own band and the, the dancers, they, um, they work for one month in the establishment and then they change. So you have an um, exchange of dancers. So normally the dancers know the musicians of this venue or know the musicians of the other venue. Sometimes they work well with some bands and then they don't work well with some other bands. And, is really uh, common that dancers say that you have to have a nice relationship with the musicians because if not, if not, like if you don't have a nice relationship, they can trick you in the middle of the dance and they can do something like to stop the music before you start the dancing and they can, they can play this kind of uh, very mean games with the dancer if they, they don't like you. So yeah, it has a lot to do with the personal relationship also. So it's not just, that's why I was, saying that is a dialogue. In that case, you can see that is a very well connection between the dancer and the musician. They probably have a nice relationship in a personal level also because it determines the, the, the way this, this the dialogue is established. But if you don't have a nice relationship with the musicians, that can be very tricky for you. <laughs> and yeah, it depends also like on the abilities you have with hearing it or establishing this connection. Sorry, just to complete, thanks for, the, for, thanks for the response, but just to complete, while you were talking, it just occurred to me that maybe it, it is relevant or is important to the whole discussion of how the rhythms are being configured um, to also bring into consideration the affective relationship between participants, because uh, I, I'm connecting also to the previous presentations where we were speaking about uh, this horizontality or just or more like this connection between practitioners to reach a certain rhythmicity. But I was, because of what you're saying, I was connecting it to that and maybe affections, the, the affects between one another is what prevents us or facilitates um, this, this common ryth rhythmicity, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, I, I do believe that. And I think uh, music and dance is not a, a mechanical thing, although it's very mathematical, it's not me mechanic and has a lot of effect involved in that. And you can see in this, both presentations that the, the relationship with the public is very important and relationship with the musician is very important. And not just only on, um, on the material level or in a commercial level, of course, like you have is a commercial relationship, but you have to have like this matter of affect. Like it was really common for uh, the dancers I interviewed in my field work that Brazilian dancers say that they prefer to work in Egypt because of the energy of the public. The people know the music, the people know like what you're doing. So the energy that they receive from the public is what make their dance uh, be alive. It's what make their dance like to be developed the way they want. So I think this aff affection in affect are, is really important uh, for sure in the development of rhythm and music and dance. Thank you, Nayara, for your answer. We have uh, one more question from uh, Sinibaldo de Rosa. Hello, hello. Uh, mm, I just uh, wanted to thank you, Nayara, for your uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, congratulations. I also Thank work you. in the Middle East and I'm also I'm a movement analyst and I use uh, Laban related systems and um, I was I definitely understand the the, um, the problems that uh, you may have with using Laban notation um, although I think that maybe the problem wouldn't be that much the 
issue with simultaneity that can be very clear with the, with the, with the kinetograph, nor I think it would be the specificity of the bodily isolation that can also be very clear and very efficaciously put down. But I think the main problem would be the fact that you are working with improvisation. And in lab annotation, the signs are always uh, time bound. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, on the other hand, Sorry, I cannot listen to you. Can you repeat the phrase? Uh, in... Yeah, the last one. So I don't know if you got. I, I... so I I understand the problem, and I was wondering, or maybe suggesting, whether you uh, considered uh, eventually looking at the question more in terms of uh, more with the lab motive description, because there you have much more space to deal with the improvisation. And I think it goes very well together with what you were saying uh, of the improvisation being uh, uh, with uh, Georgescu, you were saying that improvisation had, anyway has some patterns or has some uh, codes or restrictions. And these things you can very well spell out without, without getting caught up with the problems with uh, having a choreography that is very well scripted or choreographed in... So that was my comment. And I would like, of course, to, to be in touch or something. I... Well, thank you very much, because I think uh, it's the first person that I know that works with uh, lab annotation and lab kinetography, like related to like Middle Eastern dance and music. And yeah, for me, it, like, because you need a lot of training to read and even more to write lab annotation. And, uh, the training that I have like makes me uh, able to basically lab annotate feet. I never learned how to do it on heaps, for example. I think it, it demands a lot of uh, training that I still don't have. And it's incredible like to, to get to know you that you actually do it. And I think that yeah, you're right that to because like in this this kind of improvisational setting where like the dance starts when she wants to start and is not well divided in the beats as mm. we have uh, in the and the notation is very difficult to to make it uh, to notate. And uh, yeah, I agree that the, to to make the lab and effort analysis would be helpful. And I, I took a look on it. And but for me, I still found more clear and um, in this first moment to have like a descriptive table. But I agree with you that uh, the lab and effort analysis it's. it's Another it's, way to do it. It's not, sorry, it's not the lab and effort analysis, which would be very relevant as well because mm -hmm. you are working with uh, qualities in a way, sustained mm -hmm. in impulsive and stuff like this. But this lab and motive description, which is another system as well, is developed out of uh, lab annotation and kinetography laban, but this mm -hmm. is a much lighter system into which you can decide what to focus on and not worry about all the things. So that's the... It's a kind of another branch as well within the Laban systems. And I know the people who, who have been using Laban notation for uh, dance in the Middle East or something. So I am happy to have a dialogue. Yeah, I would like to change the, the, the bibliography because like, this is new for me. So thank you very much for contributing. Like, I would love thank to you, thank you. It's very your other contribution because uh, yeah, I came here for it like, to, to have this kind of contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your questions and for your answers. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic, uh, the thing of, of notation, uh, trying to notate rhythm, movement, without losing as well the, the whole flow or, or, or without losing the sometimes uh, qualities that might not be represented with uh, as effort. So, and I think that at some point we will have to get to a, a stable ground where we can combine both uh, in, in, in a better way. And I say, I am saying this because uh, one, when, when you read people that uh, dance or, or that they have a, a rich knowledge on body movements, uh, you will find a lot of, of uh, choreometrics or, 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 or things that are pointing towards that direction. 
Whereas when you read anthropologists, for instance, the, the level of description of body movements is super poor, uh, very poor. So I, I really know that I, I, I feel that at, at some point we will have to, to find this uh, more stable ground between both body of knowledges. So thank you so much, uh, Nayara. Uh, really appreciate your presentation. Remember that tomorrow, uh, at the same time, we will have um, two more presentations. Uh, one from Benedict Wallace. Uh, she works at, at the Ritmo Center for Inter Interdisciplinary Studies of Rhythm, and they have uh, developed fabulous systems of, of, as well of notating and recording movement. Uh, so we will be very happy to have uh, Benedict tomorrow and Maria Jose Belgra, uh, Bejarano, which will be talking about rhythmic resonances and bodily empathy, which is an amazing topic as well, kinesthetic empathy and is that type of concepts which are appearing more and more in, in this type of debates. So thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you again. Enjoy and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much, Francisco. Thank you very much for the see you tomorrow.